Good evening, church. We'll come to you tonight with another Bible study from God's Word. We'll be in Philippians chapter 1. Last week we looked at Ephesians, Paul praying for the church and, and, and that city and for those Christians there at Ephesus. And tonight we'll look at another prayer prayed by Paul for the Christians there at Philippi. Paul uh, loved church, he loved Christians, and he would minister to them and then he would write letters to encourage them to answer questions that they had, to correct them, to inform them. And that's kind of what we have here in Philippians chapter 1 where Paul is praying for this church. I, I heard about this uh, revival service at the end of uh, one service. Uh, a man, big burly man, came down front and asked the preacher to pray for his hearing. The choir was singing and the altars were full and so that minister put his hands over the years of that big burly man and prayed for God to restore his hearing. And after he got through praying, he shouted over the choir that was singing, how is your hearing now? And that big burly man replied, I don't know yet, preacher. My, my hearing's not until Wednesday at the courthouse. You know, sometimes we can get confused about prayers and praying, but Paul knew the power of prayer and prayer is simply communicating with God. It can be silent prayer. It can be uh, spoken prayer. It can even be sung. That's what psalms are. They're poems set to music. And many of those psalms are prayers to God. It's a collaborating with God where we find out what God's will is and we transfer our will and adjust our will to his. And it's a calling on God to help, to aid, to intervene. We're asking, we're seeking God to work in our lives and the lives of others. We're really going to focus on verses 9 through 11, but I got to tell you a few things. In verse 3, he said, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. When did Paul pray for these believers? He says, upon my every remembrance of you, when they crossed his mind, he shot up a prayer for them. Have you ever been sitting there and somebody, just a random thought or uh, of someone's name or someone's life pops up in your brain? That's a good indication that we should pray for them. Oftentimes, I've often said that I don't want people thinking about me. I want people praying for me. And Paul said, when, when you cross my mind, I lift you up in prayer. Verse 4 says, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you with all Joy. How did he pray? He prayed with joy. One of the greatest joys is to talk to God and talk to God for other people. It's a privilege to talk with the Lord of glory and, and every burden that we have, every person that we love, we, what we pray about, we care about. And who we pray for, we care for. He is lifting them up uh, in prayer, he, he is standing in the gap for them. It, it, intercession is to intercede or plead to God on behalf of other people. You know, like Moses was on the mountain one day when Joshua was in the valley. And every time, all the time that he had his hands lifted, Joshua and them would prevail. And his hands got heavy, so he had two people to come and help hold his hand. When we're in the valley, when we are fighting battles, it is good to know somebody is on the mountain lifting their hands to God for us. Now, Paul is going to pray, like I said last week, he's going to pray uh, specifically and spiritually. He, he prays on purpose. We may mention of this that we often pray generically and Say, God bless them, God, you know, be with them. But Paul comes and he, he names names. He gets real direct and specific in his prayers. And that's what we should do. So when did he pray for them? When they crossed his mind, how did he pray for them? With joy. He, it was a joy to bow his knee and to cry out to God on their behalf. In verses 9 through 11, we see what he prays specifically and spiritually. Let's read here in verse 9. It says, In this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment. In verse 8, he de declares how much he loves them. For God is my witness, how greatly I long for you with all affection 
of Jesus. He says, I, only God knows the heart and I will call him to the witness stand to give, uh, give evidence of how much I love you. He explains that he loves them and he wants them to know that he is praying for their love for each other. I pray, verse 9, that your love, that's agape, that's a spiritual, it's a supernatural, it's an unconditional love. It's not circumstantial. That kind of love has nothing to do with the individual. It's a choice of my heart to love other people, whether they are lovable or lovely. Uh, it seeks, it's a love that does not seek anything in return and does not have conditions placed upon it. Everything really follows love. God so loved us that he sent Jesus. Out of God's love, we can have eternal life. Paul, in the writings of 1 Corinthians 13, declared unto us that love is the greatest of virtues. He says this, and now abide faith, hope, and love, these three, but the greatest of these is love because it will last forever. One day, our hope and our faith will give way to sight, and our hope will give way to possession, but love will never end. We will always be loved by God, and we'll always love God. So Paul is praying about their love. He says, I, I pray this, that your love may abound still more and more. That word abound means to overflow. It means to exceed a standard. It means to grow. He, they had already expressed love to Paul and expressed love to one another, but he is wanting their love to grow, to expand, to no longer be contained. You know, he, he doesn't want them to have a little pinch of love. He wants their love to be like waves continually crashing on the shore of the ocean. He says, I pray, listen to what he says, I pray that your love may abound still more and more. He gives no object there. He says, I pray that your love will abound more and more. And he doesn't say, I pray that your love will abound more and more for God. Hey, he doesn't say, I, 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 I don't pray or I pray that your love will abound more and more to church or to singing, to the Bible, to the word. You know, it, he doesn't say that. He, he says, I just pray that your love will grow. He wanted their love to overflow in all directions. And in all dimensions, that it would be deeper, that it would be wider than anything else. He basically is saying, I want you to love more people more better. Now, I know that's not good English. My wife's an English teacher, and she's going to get on to me for that. More people, more better. That's not good English, but that's good preaching. That's what he's wanting. He, he's wanting their love to expand to others. And he wants them to, to love people in better, greater ways. He is making this statement to love. I pray that you love others, that it grows, that it expands, that it overflows. That word abound really speaks of a cup that's filled to the top and splashes over. We ought to be known for our love for each other. Paul prayed that they would be, last week, to be rooted and grounded in love. Now he's praying that they would abound in love. He says, not only no, that you bound, uh, that your love may abound still more and more, and then he prays in knowledge. He wants them to know what real love is. He wants them to know the truth of love. He wants to know why they're supposed to love. He, he wants them to be in the word. And let me tell you something, friend, a person who opens and gets in their Bible with an open heart will end up with a transformed life. And he wanted them to stay in the scriptures, to uh, uh, just uh, acquire data and truths and facts and principles from the word of God and where the true definition and demonstration of love is found in the Bible. The world's definition of love is, is silly. It's, it's, it's futile, it's, it's shallow. We love because of what somebody does or how somebody looks. You know, when the moon hits their eye like a big pizza pie, that's amore, that's love. Well, I, no, he, true love is found in the Bible. He wants them to know what love is. And then he, and then he goes on to pray and says, I, I, I pray that your love may abound still more and, and more in knowledge and in all discernment. That word discern means to apply. He, he wants them to know how to love. So you see, the Bible teaches them what love is, and then it describes how we are to love other 
people. Discernment is practical application of instruction. It, it really speaks of day-to-day -day common sense. He wants us to know what love is and to do what we know. Love. Uh, he wants us to know what love uh, needs to be applied, how it needs to be applied and, and practiced in people's lives. Uh, the Bible says charity or love covers the multitudes of sin. One way we can love people is by forgiving them. One way we show love is by meeting the needs of others. One way we show love is by being obedient to love. And someone just described uh, love at, at, from a parent's perspective to a child. It's not spelled L-O-V-E. It's spelled T-I-M-E. We give time to that which we love. Love is to define us and to describe us. John said in 1 John 3 and 14 that love is an evidence of salvation. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. John is really plain spoken. He says, love, if you love your brethren, it's an evidence that you have passed from death to life and love. Jesus said, by this, all men shall know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. It's an evidence that we are a follower of Jesus. And we learned last week that without love, we are nothing. I got to thinking as I was studying this um, about the song Queen, can anybody find me somebody to love? There are people out in our world, in our community that need to know that we love them and that God loves them. Not only did he pray about their love in verse 9 and verse 10, he prayed about their life. He says that you may approve, he's praying, that you may approve the things that are ex excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense to the day of Christ. He prays about their mentality. He says, I, I, I pray that you may approve. That means to discern, it means to esteem, it means to place value on, to, to make a correct estimate about. I approve the things that are excellent. He is praying that they would be able to choose between uh, two good options, that he would, they would choose the best choice of two good options. Many people can choose between bad and good. Very few are able in our day and time, are able to discern, able to choose between better and best, or good and best. It's, it means to be able to contrive and estimate that which is vital, that which is valuable, that which is profitable, that which is eternal versus that which is temporary. Life is full of choices and the choices we make today will impact what our life will be like tomorrow. And he is asking God to help them not to saddle, settle for the status quo, not, but they would seek that which is excellent. That which is the will of God and would please and honor God. That they would choose that which is truly important. We, we, we fail at this and I, I struggle with this myself from time to time. You know, Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians how we are to discipline our bodies. Uh, and, you know, he paints a picture of a runner. An Olympic runner can choose to eat all a, a gallon of ice cream. That, he, there's nothing wrong with that, but that's not best for him. He, he won't be able to win the gold medal if he wanted to uh, because he's not disciplined his life. And Paul is wanting these believers and, uh, at, at Philippi to, to prioritize that which is valuable and that which is eternal, to not be content to be average or to settle for the status quo. He... he he doesn't want them to be distracted by good things. We are distracted not by sinful things, but things not really that are good. TV in itself is it's not sinful, but it can be distracting. Our cell phones are not necessarily sinful in their cells. They can become sinful by what we do, but we can be distracted by our hobbies and pursuits, our jobs, our, our families. He is praying that they would think rightly about the experiences of life and the choices that they make, that you may approve the things that are acceptable. So he prays about their mentality. He goes on to pray about their sincerity. Look what it says, that you may be sincere 
and without offense to the day of Christ. Not only did he pray that they would choose the right things, he prays that they would be the right people. Two, he's praying for them to be people of honesty and integrity. That word sincere means to be without hypocrisy. He prayed that they would be genuine, that they would be real, that they would be authentic in their lives, that they would be transparent. Uh, it really speaks, that word sincere means to be without wax. Uh, pottery in that day uh, was, was cheap and there would be vendors and if it had a crack on it, the way to conceal that crack from the average buyer was to place some wax on it and it would kind of make an appearance of a, of a clay pot that was whole and the way to test uh, the way the realness or the authenticity of that, cra uh, that clay pot was to hold it up into the sunlight and when that pot was held to the sunlight you would be able to discern or tell if it had cracks in it or not. They were able to detect the flaws and he wants, you know, God understands and knows that you and I will never be perfect. We will never be completely perfect, but we also ought to strive not to be a hypocrite. Even though we can never be perfect, we should never desire to want to be called a hypocrite. A hypocrite is someone who possesses the truth but does not practice it. They know what is right and yet they live totally different. Who they are on Sunday is totally different than the way they are the rest of the week. Listen to what someone said. Be who you is. Because if you ain't, uh, because if you is who you ain't, then you ain't who you is. He is praying that they would have the mentality to choose the right thing and that they would be per people of integrity to be the right person. He, he says uh, that you may be sincere and without offense to the day of Christ. He, he's praying, I pray you so live a life that your life won't be a stumbling block. That you won't offend their cause to trip up. He, he, he's praying that they will not influence people in a negative way. He, he prays that they would not be a hindering, a, a hindrance to people coming to church and coming to Christ. Some people will come to Jesus or come to church because of the people who do come to church. And there's going to be some people who don't come to church because of the people who do come to church. Our walk matters. How we live matters. Our walk, our life, our Christian life can greatly influence positively and negatively our friends, our family, and the people we live close to. Someone said when the Lord's sheep, white sheep become dirty gray, all the black sheep feel more comfortable. Are you living a life that's choosing the best over the good? That you're prizing the eternal and that which is valuable and profitable over that which is temporary. Are you doing that? Am I doing that? Am I living a life of sincerity, honesty, and integrity? Am, am I the same wherever I am? By name and nature are glued together. And is my life a stumbling block? Am I a help or a hindrance to the cause of the church in Christ? We need to pray that we're not a, an offense. Uh, we need to ask, does the Bible, whatever we make decisions to do, we, we need to ask the question, does the Bible say anything about this? That's why we need to be in the book. Uh, we, we ask the question, is the action that I'm about to take, will it glorify God? Will it hurt me physically or spiritually? Will it cause others to stumble? And would I still do it if I knew that Jesus was right here? He's praying that they would honor the, the, with the Lord with right choices and right lives without offense to the day of Christ, to the end of time, till we stand before him eyeball to eyeball. You know, some people are not afraid to die, but many are ashamed to die. Many people have made a, a, a choice. They've asked Jesus to come in their heart and be their savior, and yet they can live so carnal in their lives. They make bad choices, and they're ashamed to die. I, I want to be ready to die no matter what when we stand before the Lord till the day of Christ. You see, this Christian life is not on again, off again. It's, it's not here and there, now and then. It's day in, day out until the end of all days. He prays about their love. He prays about their life. 
And then he prays about their labor. Look what it says there in verse 11. Being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. He prays that they would be full of good deeds and working for the sole purpose of glorifying God, doing good things, that they would live holy lives and partake in service and fruits connected through Jesus that would bring honor to Jesus and people to Jesus, that their lives would be filled with right things, fruits of righteousness. What are some right things that we ought to be doing? Well, we ought to be reading our Bibles. We ought to be saying our prayers. We ought to be seeking God to help us live clean lives. We ought to be telling people about Jesus. It's right things. You see, and all that we do is not so people will look at us. It's so people will glorify God. How, there is a God that's so amazing in grace and goodness that he changed them. And if he can change them, he can change me. I want my life to be a testimony of the grace of God. Because I know what I was. And thank God I, I'm not what I used to be. I'm not what I ought to be. And I'm not what I'm going to be. But I want my life to be a testimony that if God can do something with Nick Flowers, then he can do something with me. And all glory goes to God. All that we can do, all the strength, all the power, all the goodness comes from Jesus. And all glory belongs to Jesus Matthew 5, 14 through 16 tells us to let, that we are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it in a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all those who are in the house. Then it says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. That's what he says, of being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus, Jesus, if I'm the vine and you're the branches, if you abide in me, you will bear much fruit. We have no strength to be loving on our own. We have no strength to be joyful on our own. We have no strength to be patient on our own. We have no strength to be long-suffering on our own. But when we abide in Christ, he gives us strength to do all that we want to do. And he says, apart from me, you can do Nothing. You want to know why so many people are doing nothing? It's because they are separated. They are distant from Jesus. Jesus said in John 15, 8, By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. He's praying, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Any good thing that goes on in our church, all glory goes to God. We plant and water, but God gives the increase. Any good thing that shows up in my life is not a testament to me. It's a, te it's a testimony to who God is and how good God is and how gracious God is and how patient God has been with me. You see, the honor doesn't go necessarily to the one, to the painting. It goes to the artist. The honor doesn't go to the plants, it goes to the gardener. And the honor of our lives doesn't go to us, it goes to the one who has given us life, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul, Paul prays spiritually. He prays about our love. Are we loving people? Is our love over, overflowing? Are we willing to love the unlovable? Are we willing to love those who are unlike us? That's what Paul's praying for, friend. He's not just praying that you just love those who are like you. He prays for love to those who are not like us. Are we loving? Are we overflowing? Are we growing in our knowledge of what real love looks like and, gives, and praying for the courage to apply that love? He's praying for their life that we would have the mentality to choose that which is best. Not necessarily that which is good, but that which is best. And then our lives are full of integrity, that we would not be a hindrance to the cause of Christ and the mission and ministry of the church, that we, our lives would be a testimony of who God is and that we're serving the Lord, that we're laboring for the Lord. You know, there's so many people that are sitting on their blessed assurance. They're not doing anything. And God has given us work to do. And we must work the works of him who sent us while it is day for night comes and no man work. I guarantee you when you stand before God to the day of Christ, when we stand before him, we will, we will have great regret that we didn't do more, that we didn't serve more, that we didn't give more, that we didn't pray 
more. And we still have breath in our body, so we still have opportunity to do more. You don't wait too late to do what is right in serving the Lord. I heard about this four-year-old little boy who was mis misbehaving in church, and, and his dad picked him up and was going to take him outside and have him come to Jesus meeting or give him an attitude adjustment. And as the dad picked him up and was taking him outside, he yelled out to the congregation, y'all please pray for me. This is what, if you're going to pray for me, pray that I would love, love in an abounding way. Pray that my life would be sincere and real and genuine. And my life, in my life, I'd be choosing the right things. And pray that my labor would be fruitful and that God would get the glory. Y'all pray for me. And we need to pray for each other. Not just material things, but spiritual things. I'm going to spend the rest of this time, we got a few minutes left, and I just want to pray. Pray for you right where you are. If you don't know Jesus, he loved you so much that he sent that he died on the cross for you. God loved you so much that he sent Jesus to die on the cross for you. For nothing wrong he did, but for the wrong you did. And if you will realize that you're a sinner and you can never please God in your own state, that, that you need some help and that you'll put your, your trust in the finished work of Jesus, the Bible says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And many of you are saved that are listening. And I'm going to be praying not only for salvation for you, but I'm going to be praying that for many of you that you would love, that you would live, that you would labor in a better and greater uh, God-honoring way in the days to come. I want you to know I love you, and I'm here to help you any way I can. Let me pray for you right quick. God, I come and I lift up those who are tuning in and they've never put their faith and trust in you. God, I pray that you will reveal to them their need their great need, their great sin, but also reveal to them that you are a great Savior and that you would draw them to the cross and that they would repent and turn in faith to you and by your grace be gloriously and wonderfully and eternally saved. But I know many that are listening are already saved. But God, we can get so stuck in a rut and doing our own thing. God, help us to love. Help us to love more people, more better. God, help us to live a life of integrity, to be real and genuine, not a fraud, not a hypocrite, not a fake, not a phony, but the real deal that our lives would never be a hindrance to coming to Jesus or to church. And God, help us to live and labor and serve you. Help us to be involved in doing right things, holy things, God-honoring things. And we pray that Jesus would be glorified in all that we do. Lord, we pray for those who are sad that you'd give them comfort. But most of all, we're just thankful that we can come to you. Help us, Lord. Help us in the days to come. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, I love you, church. See you soon.